let's start. All right, and we are live. I'm with Nishal, founder of Wazirx. Nishal, how are you today? Hey, Sunny. Uh, I'm good, and uh, thanks for inviting me on the show. Look forward to having a good conversation. Definitely, definitely. So maybe just to call out the pink elephant, um, this is technically our first time meeting face to face, if you want to call it that. Uh, we've exchanged DMs in the past over the years, um, and I've had a lot, a lot of respect for you as well. I've been watching from afar, and and so I'm super excited to get to connect with you and and chat. Yeah, same here. I I, I think uh, we've been chatting for a long time, but finally, good to meet you face to face online. Love it, love it. So, uh, so I guess so. When what year was that, though? Do you remember uh, when we had first maybe like just kind of crossed? It was what twenty. 15, 16, maybe around. Yeah, there? yeah, yeah. I, re- exactly. I don't really. Re- yeah, I, I need to go back now. Now that you asked, but I think I know you for a long time because you know uh, we've mm. been chatting on and off. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, so I guess my my first, um, you know, kind of question that I like to start with is is kind of like what your story. Uh, prior to and after learning about Bitcoin, um, you know, as as kind of a, a launch pad. And yeah, and then, you know, feel free to take your time, I guess. Uh, yeah, so yeah that's, that's pretty much the question. Sure. Uh, you know, for me, it's, it's been like, uh, I had, uh, I would say, three major uh, points in time where I encountered uh, Bitcoin. And uh, the third time was a point where I decided to go all in. Uh, the first time I encountered Bitcoin was way early, right in 2009. Um, I used to be one of those people who used to try everything that was launched and everything that you uh, read about on any of these blogs like TechCrunch and all the other uh, you know tech blogs forums. So I came across Bitcoin as a, a, and I saw that we could mine it. So I had a desktop. I mined it for a few days. I don't even remember. It's a very vague memory. Wow. Okay. Um, and uh, then I was like, um, sure, it's fun, but what do I do with this? So I just let it be, uh, and I forgot all about it. And uh, and during this point, I had started up a different company. In 2010, I started up a different company called uh, Crowdfire, uh, which is a social media management app. So I was early into Twitter as well. I was one of those early uh, devs building on the Twitter API. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I remember uh, having conversations with the uh, early dev, uh, Twitter dev platform people and uh, helping them with bugs on the API and those days. Um, so, so I got into, uh, you know, the whole social media management product so, and growth so, so, product. So you you were you're from where then? You're from India. You you. It sounds like you're a technical guy. You're coming in it more from. Did you study study some something technical or more like self? Yeah, yeah. I I no no. I I'm a software engineer. Um, hmm. um you know, it's not very rare in India. So <laughs> I'm one of those uh, software engineer. I just uh, I I started my career as a software developer, and then about one and a half years, I worked for a corporate company. Uh, got bored and then I got into a startup uh, and that was burp.com which was like your uh, Yelp uh, sort of like the Yelp for India back then and uh, over there I worked for a year and a half again before I quit to start mm-hmm. my own uh, uh, company and uh, so when uh, so I was building this in 2010 the soft social media uh, management app and I scaled it up to about I think uh, 7 million users before I raised the uh, uh, first funding in 2015. Uh, and uh, that was about two and a half million dollars that we raised and uh, then scaled it again. And, uh, but in between this, so 2013 or 2012 was the second time that I encountered Bitcoin. And uh, this was the time when uh, different Bitcoin wallets started emerging and I started signing up and trying to use them. Uh, uh, And this was also the time when friends sent uh, Bitcoins freely to each other. And, uh, you know, I remember getting a Bitcoin from a few of my friends saying, uh, check this out. And I said, I know this, but let me see what this is all about. And again, I lost interest uh, for, I don't know why, but you know, the thing is when you are busy building something, uh, everything else you really can't really put a, you know, a head to it and say what this is. So you tend to ignore every other technology when you're working on something. I was busy with my social media product. So everything else seemed, uh, you know, less interesting to me. 
So that happened. And uh, I mean, so where, where, where were you? Sorry, I'm just curious. Were you in San Francisco? Were you in India still? Uh, like building... I, I was I was in between uh, because mm. of the nature of our product, which was global. And uh, we had about 40% of Got our it. users, the top percentage of our users from uh, uh, the US. So I spent uh, mm-hmm. about six months in the US and then six months in India. That was like a major part of uh, 2015, 2016, 2017 for me. Um, so yeah, I was spending a long, a lot of time in San Francisco and uh, Mumbai. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Okay. All right, we're back. Yeah. So I I was spending about six months in San Francisco and six months in Mumbai. This was like a major part of 2015, 2016, 2017 for me. Um, uh, the reason being because of our user base being more mm-hmm. uh, in the US. Uh-huh. So that that's how uh, and that's also how the third interaction, which was uh, 2017 in the US, was very interesting because uh, I I came across all of these uh, different entrepreneurs building. Uh, you know, stuff on um, uh, Bitcoin and blockchain and talk about cryptocurrency that I was exposed to that a lot in the, I used to attend a lot of meetups and I kept hearing about this, um, you know, so, so I, I started looking into it and I think that's what the San Francisco culture is. You just get to know the in thing and then you want to know more about it and you start uh, reading up about it. Uh, so, so that happened. Um, and, uh, So yeah, yeah, anyway, sorry about that technical difficulty there, but I think we're back. Nishal, are you there? Again. Mm. Okay, we're back. Okay. Sorry about um, that, sure, Nishal, sure. like three or four times I had a little bit of a technical glitch. But okay, we should be back now. So you were pretty much saying how you were going back and forth between San Francisco and India. Um, you were just, you know, you finished saying how you were, you'd, uh, so just to sum up the whole thing, at least my kind of highlights so far, right? So you, uh, you're from India originally, you're, you've got a technical background, you worked in industry for a couple of years, um, uh, essentially decided to do your own startup, was intrigued by Twitter, which by the way, I am as well, and uh, built essentially a startup uh, that, that connected to Twitter's API. Uh, raised funding and then that kind of brought you to this place where you were now traveling back and forth you had an interest in bitcoin and then you started saying you were attending meetups was that in in bombay or in, in san francisco or both or no uh it was in san francisco in san francisco um, okay there were quite a few meetups yeah yeah so i used to you know attend them just to network and get to know what's happening in the ecosystem and uh that's where i started hearing about uh, you know, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin and blockchain and all year, over again. What year is this now? This is 2000. This was uh, 2017. Oh, 2017. So okay, first yeah, half yeah. of 2017. Gotcha, gotcha. So this is almost, so 2009, you said you started mining. Did you hold on to that Bitcoin or what? <laughs> or did you lose it like most people? So, uh, you know, no, I, I lost it. I lost it. And I really don't remember how much I mined or, you know, what the numbers were. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, and I lost it because I sold that computer a few years later. Oh, um, yeah, yeah, but yeah. it's okay. There's no it's regret. All good. No regret. Regret. Okay, so 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 almost now in 2017. Yeah. Now you're attending meetups in San Francisco. You're you're okay. So carry on. Yeah. So uh, so I started hearing about this, and uh, you know, interestingly, two things happened. So my company at that time, uh, we had reached about uh, 15 million users. And, uh, you know, it was growing really uh, well. And uh, our focus was to not um, so much on revenue, though we were already doing multi-million dollars in revenue, but it was more on uh, how do you go to, let's say, 50 to 100 million users using your product. So I I was focused more on the consumer uh, acquisition part. And uh, that was a time when all of these social networks like Twitter, Instagram, they started changing their API policies and terms and conditions. Uh, their whole objective was they did not want uh, large consumer products built on top of them. What they wanted were, uh, they were okay with uh, business to business products built, but they did not want any consumer products built on top of them. And uh, uh, that sort of had us uh, changing our business model and changing the way we uh, presented features to our users to focus on businesses. And what that meant was uh, you had to become a revenue driven company and, uh, you know, focus more on uh, bringing in customers and businesses to your product. Um, and that's when I realized that these social networks can, or anyone on top of whom you build your products, they can change the rules of the game when they want. And uh, that's where the whole decentralization aspect really looked uh, bright. And I, 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 
I began t- telling myself that this is a future where if as a developer, you want to build something, you need to be building where uh, no one can stop you from realizing your dreams and uh, from, you know, continuing to build what you want. So uh, that these two combinations, uh, they, I would say seeded the idea of building something in the crypto world. And uh, eventually in 20, in the, during the, towards the end of 2017 uh, is when I finally it, 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 launched so, the exchange. It, it, so, so just, just to be like super clear. So about that, that insight. So it was more rooted in, in, in kind of Twitter saying that you weren't able to uh, continue with your business plan. Is that what you meant about where nobody could stop you or. It, well, I'm just curious yeah, what you so meant about is, that. Uh, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll give you an example. Like uh, one of the features we had was where uh, people could actually find and follow other people of interest to them. We used to give you those follower recommendations uh, to people. And uh, Twitter said you cannot build that feature. So we had to remove that feature. Why? Because today, if you see, Twitter gives that feature to you on their own. And they do not want anyone else competing with those kind of features. So uh, this is just an example. But Twitter started dictating what we could build and what we could not. So, uh, so we, we had to remove some of the features and those are important features and we had to uh, bring in new features so that we can continue to grow as a company. Uh, but that was th- these new features we brought were focused on the businesses. Like, uh, for example, posting on all social networks, more than consumers, businesses wanted to manage their uh, social media accounts. So we went more towards businesses. And, uh, and this is what I realized that, uh, you know, all of these giants who te- even uh, take for example even go to a higher level even the play store and the app store dictates what you can build and what you cannot uh, they they say that it's in the name of uh, user protection and this and that but ultimately they protect their own business and make sure that you do not encroach on their own business model mm-hmm. uh, so so this i think is not really a sustainable uh, future that is being built and uh, the future is where you are free to do what you want to do. And uh, people are free to choose what they want to use and how they want to use it. And uh, that's where I see decentralization fitting into this whole uh, uh, future that I believe will be uh, on, online someday. Um, so yeah, so that was the first uh, pull towards this in, 20, in the first half of 2017. And then the second half of 2017 was just that... Uh, I came back to India. I was trying to, you know, buy a few uh, cryptocurrencies and it took me a long time. Um, back then, I think there was a huge rush of people to all the exchanges. Uh, KYCs were slow. Bank accounts were, uh, you know, it used to take a long time to credit once we send our money to the exchange account. So it took me about, uh, I wouldn't name the exchange, but it took me about two days to buy my first Bitcoin. And uh, by that time, the prices had changed uh, because 2017 was that crazy. Uh, so, so I could buy less Bitcoin than what I wanted. Uh, you know, so this, this told me that there's also an opportunity to build something where people could easily buy their Bitcoins and quickly. Um, and that was the motivation that got me to uh, eventually launch uh, Wazirx. Well, that's fascinating. And, uh, yeah, that's how I've been in, into this ecosystem. But I think my first love is always the uh, fact that it's decentralized as a technology. Where, you know, mm. if I want to build something, no one can tell me not to build it. There's no one, not even the uh, creators of the blockchain can tell me not to build something. So I think I like that most. Uh, maybe I'm jumping ahead of it, ahead of it, but isn't it ironic what ended up happening in the next part of the story where people did tell us what we could do and couldn't do? <laughs> so that's, see, you, know, you know, that's the thing. Uh, I, 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 tell, I tell this to a lot of my uh, uh, friends around me that I... I I, I just looked at it from a technology point of view and said, no one can stop us. I never in my wildest dream thought that regulation also plays a part in, uh, you know, when you're building something innovative. Uh, I think uh, that was also because of the fact that uh, crypto touches the financial world, which is where all of this, uh, you know, craziness has crept in. Where the, so it was just three weeks after we launched and the government said, you cannot have, uh, the RBI said, you can't have a bank account. And I was like, here, here we go again. You know, <laughs> someone else has come in now. So yeah, what do you do? You do, you can't you don't have an utopian world, but at least from a developer point of view, I think uh, it's great. I still can build what I want. What, what's the, what's what's the timeline on that initial? So now, where are you now? You're in 2017 still, or when did you guys launch? And then so yeah. uh, if you want to Around know it. the launch story, see the thing is uh, in 2017 we already had a lot of exchanges in India. 
and uh, while i thought that uh, the the experience was not good i i i would say i'm not the right kind of uh, user because i'm never happy with products that i use i always find flaws uh, that's how i think uh, we are so i wanted to make sure that this was true that there was a need for a new exchange in india uh, so in 2017 december uh, no i think 2018 jan we i i just announced saying i would be building an exchange just to test the water I sorry, sorry. What, what, when December 2017? No, no, Jan, 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 20, Jan. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I just, I just made an announcement on Twitter and uh, on Facebook saying I'll be building an exchange, mm. and I just wanted to test it out. I didn't want to build it because I thought if uh, I had a number like if uh, 500 people sign up, I'm not building it. But if uh, more than 500 people sign up, I'm going to go ahead and build it. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, because nobody, no, if nobody notices, you can, you need not build it. That was my uh, idea. But uh, I, I don't know. Uh, for some reason, uh, tens of thousands of people signed up Ooh. within, uh, I think, uh, five, five or six days. And I said, uh, you know, there's a market, there's a need. Let's build it. So that's how it happened. This was Jan 2018, and mm-hmm. we quickly started uh, work on the exchange. And March 2018, we launched it. So it took us about three months to launch uh, version one of the product. And uh, so now let's maybe segue into a bit about yeah the story around Wazirx. So first of all, just for people you know listeners around the world, can you explain what that means, or what where the inspiration uh, for the name came from? So so Wazi, uh, uh, it's a uh, it's the queen piece in chess. Um, you call it Wazir in Hindi. Um, um, so I I wanted to build something where uh, you know the because it's a financial market and traders uh, i see trading as you making the move that you you know want like when to buy when to sell and stuff so in the game of chess the most powerful piece is the queen piece and mm. uh, i wanted our product to be that for our users mm. where uh, if they're playing a game a, ch- a game of chess they should be able to make any move they want and win eventually so so we named it cool. wazir and x is for exchange, exchange. that's how got the it, name got came. it Interesting, interesting. Okay, okay. So, okay, so March, you guys launch. Uh, with, with what? Then, then, like, uh, what happens after that? You said, uh, yeah. was it a couple months? Yeah. So, later? no, it was three weeks. Eighth um, of March, we launched. I think sixth uh, of April, the um, RBI circular came in, and uh, you know, I, I think if if I had launched a year earlier and this circular came in. i'm not sure how i would have reacted but uh, because it was just 3 weeks in um, we had no choice but to tackle that you know um, to face it because uh, we we were at ground zero we had nothing to lose if you think about it we were a brand and, new exchange and you guys were just bootstrapping it then like just pretty much you were yeah. funding it yourself and yeah so we were funding it ourselves we had a small team who hmm. were building it and uh, you know we were like uh, see we hadn't really thought of revenues from day one so we ha- were prepared for that we were on zero revenue when you launch you don't really make revenues up front so so the ba- the ban uh, circular did not really scare us so much it was just unexpected <laughs> i'm sure it was unexpected for everyone mm-hmm. and there was also a time period of uh, denial saying uh, this is probably to scare off people and uh, they wouldn't be serious about it and uh, i think for a couple of months we really thought that they would uh, roll it back and uh, not implement it um, but yeah we continued building without worrying about the circular and then i think in june it became became apparent that uh, within a month the banking ban would be coming into effect so so that was a time when we decided to build a solution to this we said it's not illegal it's just that you won't have a bank account uh so what do you do what is the best solution and uh, peer to peer seem to be the best solution uh now a bit of a background peer to peer back then used to be your local bitcoins where uh, like a classified site you put a buy or a sell uh, request and someone else can come and manually match with you uh we knew that that's not a model to scale uh in india because people usually like something easy and uh, the easy experience was your uh, normal trading experience which people were used to so we modeled our peer to peer on the same um, uh, way of uh, an open order book so this was the first peer to peer exchange in the world which had an open order book and self matching auto matching so you did not have to like pick your sellers and buyers on a uh, the way you do in a regular p2p 
you just had to put your buy or sell order we would automatically match you and then you make the transfer so it was as simple as that and uh, that gave us the major boost in adoption i would say uh, from july when we launched it uh, until december we had i think we had become the biggest by then in terms of uh, user sign ups volumes everything so yeah uh, adversity you know helped us so that was good that is fascinating uh okay so can you talk about that though like that model and like how it uh worked in the face of this because you're still leveraging banks I, I get it because i've been you know i don't vote local bitcoins and all that but just just so that people like because i think this is a a very interesting you know case study if you will right for for even like global entrepreneurs and whatnot right like what's happening in india and i don't think a lot of people really know but uh but i but i mean i i would love for you to kind of peel the onion back a bit on that and and, and kind of explain why that model was a bit more maybe um uh more like you know a queen right where i could just like withstand uh, uh the weather and and kind of you know and not be susceptible to what the rbi did yeah see the thing is uh, what did the rbi do they said you can't have a bank account um and uh, we knew that uh, without a bank account the only way to do this would be a three party system where uh, if you are a buyer i am a seller and uh, we have an exchange in between um, i would have to transfer the fiat from my bank account directly to the uh, seller's bank account and uh, what can the exchange do is uh, custody the crypto because it was not illegal to custody crypto so we acted as the crypto custodian while uh, the buyer sends the money to the seller's bank account and as soon as the seller gets the money they would inform us saying they have received the money and then we would uh, move the crypto to the buyer's uh, wazirx wallet uh, so it was a beautiful three party system and this was not innovative because like i said there have been peer to peer systems already the innovative part was uh, when we looked at the existing peer to peer you know uh, see i think when we build products we want to cut the decision making for users and uh, in a regular peer to peer you have a lot of decision making points it starts from you being presented with uh, 20 sellers on a page and you have to select which one is the right seller uh, and that selection is not purely based on price there is a rating system and there is liquidity and let's say if you want to buy one bitcoin and you have five sellers selling 0.2 bitcoin you have to match with all five of them individually so if you if you look at it you know set aside everything if i was to tell you how many decisions you are going to make to buy your first bitcoin uh, in a peer to peer i think there are at least uh, 7 to 10 decision making points that come in between before you finally buy that our objective was how do we make it into one decision which is at what price you want to buy that's the decision that you do when you transact on a regular exchange as well on an open order book exchange so so we said how do we cut this out is by disappearing by you know like removing the name of the seller the rating of the seller removing everything and giving a regular order book to people now when there is a match we just show you the bank account where you need to make the transfer you don't need, really need to bother about the ratings about the quantity nothing we'll make sure we manage all of that so so we did that and that was hard to build uh, there's a reason why nobody had built an automated p2p uh but we decided we would and uh you know just just just, just one thing the the rating thing right so how do you forego that because isn't that a key part of that experience because what if it's literally somebody trying to scam you so see i think the uh, the scam or you're part, doing kyc on yeah, that type of thing yeah, so you're so, reducing your risk right so we reduce the risk to a certain extent and also uh well i can't go deep uh, there's a lot of algorithm we ended up building but uh, we sort of have mm-hmm. like a uh, i would say a waterfall model where you start with a uh, like a step model where you start with a small amount that you can transact and then we slowly increase that so we know the risk that we take on a user on day 1 versus on a user on day 30 of using this product uh, so we scale up the risk according to the transaction volumes that you do uh, slowly over time so you can't come on day one as a seller and uh, or a buyer and buy a large amount but if you are a good actor in the system eventually your limits increase and uh, that was a conscious decision we took which uh, prevented fraud we had almost no fraud in the system uh, and uh, our uh, average time was about i think 1 minute or 2 minute max for completing a transaction 
and that was phenomenal that that has not been achieved in peer to peer it's just under 2 minutes you complete the transaction where uh, the buyer has sent the pr to the seller and the seller has released the crypto to the buyer that was the speed and uh, you know so it just worked it was just about solving it wanting to solve it and i think uh, we did it right well hats off i mean what a what a feat right you were told uh, you're not going to be told what to do and even in the face of uh, seemingly insurmountable odds uh, you decided to innovate your way through it so so hats off to you uh Michelle. that's awesome man um okay so uh, <laughs> that's exciting because why is it, that, why is that exciting right because this was always a, the this was always the checkmate for them right like bitcoin doesn't solve it it's you got you got to depend on banks and you need banks you can't just rely on alleyways and cash um so <sighs> man this is crazy right so you've essentially like come up with a model that is in some ways much more um impervious to to you know to violence <laughs> yeah i think uh, see uh, our our concept was sim- simple unless it's made illegal we will do whatever it takes to ensure that people can buy and sell crypto in india mm-hmm. and uh, with that in mind we did this uh so you don't really need question, banks would, so why did your just curious like why did your legal team not stress out about the fact that this circular applied to personal banks as well right not just businesses i thought so the thing is if you look at it the circular the rbi does not really um you know tell the people of india what to do it only can tell the banks that it uh, oversees and uh, we knew that if you look at uh, the transaction that happened today banks do not really take an objective view on what transactions you are supposed to do uh, and they don't if they really had to do it seriously they should first always have a reason for the transfer that you are supposed to make and that never exists in our a personal transfer when you are a business let's say you are sending money outside the country you have to state a reason and your bank does go through that and then they'll initiate those transfers but in personal transactions i can send money to a friend and nobody really uh, you know that's not breaking the law so we also knew that our people are not breaking the law uh, if the banks want to really go after the people they are free to do it but we knew that you can't go after millions of people uh, that's not practical and uh, that's not what banks want to do so you know it, it's what it was uh, we were not breaking the law and we said let's go ahead with that um, you know worrying about uh, something that is not against the law i don't think we have to do that at all uh, we mm. can and, and see the thing is uh, we've also seen technology if you think about it this is the same question i can ask uh, the guys at uber and ola on uh, you know uh, we have taxis in the city who have to take a license how come you are coming up in between somewhere and able to charge whatever money you want to the users and not have a meter uh, running in the local uh, cities Uh, but that works because they they use a different license and they use a different way uh, all legally but they don't have any regulations yet uh, same with airbnb you need on one one end you have hotels which have to take all the licenses in the world to give you a room to stay and then suddenly someone can give you a, a room in their house now there's nothing illegal about it so that was the same uh, concept with peer to peer there's nothing illegal about it uh, there's no formal laws and i think that's okay because uh, you know always technology comes first and laws come second and if we do not show the government what is possible how will they formulate the laws so i think we should show the, the government what all is possible so that they can take an informed decision now they can now they know what are the possibilities out there you know yeah 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 cool man I, well I like you man you're you're great this is uh see look at the at the end of the day um I, like i'm a bitcoiner i mean i consider myself a bitcoiner i'm touched by the idea and uh, and the fact that it calls upon um you know people just like uh, you and I who never even met until today but kind of calls on us and and uh and gets us to do what we do i think is just super inspirational so i think that is a magnificent story so what next what happens after that you guys come up with the solution you're scaling now i don't know what's the next big milestone that happened in your guys's yeah. uh journey 
Yeah, so uh, 2018 went well. Uh, we, mm. you know, started capturing the market, and then uh, we went into 2019. Uh, I think towards uh, the end of 2019 is also we realized that this is going to be a long battle. So you know, initially it was more of a, a temporary solution. We thought the peer to peer uh, for a few months, and uh, then we thought we, as you know, the Supreme Court uh, case against the uh, RBI circular also existed. We thought it would get done. You know. How naive now when I look back, <laughs> but I thought it would be, uh, you know, uh, there would be a result in two to three week months time. So that did not happen. So I started a campaign in India called India Wants Crypto. Um, I think my my reason for starting a campaign, um, and for those who don't know, the idea was to tweet every day about uh, cryptocurrency and tag our prime minister and our finance minister, uh, with the hope that someday they'll see it and uh, maybe retweet or reply or do something. Um, that never happened, but a lot of other ministers got in touch. A lot of media got in touch. So I think eventually the, the goal has been uh, to spread the information to as mm -hmm. many people as possible. Because what was happening until then was uh, while we had so many exchanges and everyone was doing their part to uh, you know win the case or uh, do the right thing, but no one was vocal about it out in the public. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know if you look at laws and regulations, uh, there are certain reasons why they come in. Either if that's a lot of bad happening and the government wants to stop that, or if a lot of people are involved and the government wants to help them. Now, I, I firmly believe that uh, if we want the good, right crypto regulations, instead of uh, letting the bad happen and the government intervene, we should let as much good happen in the ecosystem so that the government intervenes for the right reason, like to enhance it uh, rather than to you know suppress it. Uh, and this starts with spreading information amongst people on what cryptocurrencies are, what uh, Bitcoin is, what other cryptos are. Why do you need this? What is decentralization? So my campaign was all about that and it's been uh, still running. Um, and now it's been more than two years. I've been tweeting every day and I love it. Now it's become like a, uh, uh, you know, thing I don't not want to do, um, but it's, it's fun. It's fun to spread information. So that started, that gave a lot of, uh, I would say push to the whole India uh, uh, situation in the even in the international media everyone started covering so that's good and then we entered uh, 2019 uh, on a I would say on a mixed note because there was this uh, ban and then there was this uh, thing working for us and we continued to grow and uh, I started you know looking into what's next uh, because we've done this um, the market has accepted us but the market is small how do you grow this how do you, you know, grow the market, not just our business, but how do you grow the ecosystem in India? And uh, uh, that's when I met uh, uh, Binance and uh, a few people there. And I uh, realized that their mission is sort of, it overlapped with ours, which is uh, to make crypto accessible to as many people as possible. And uh, they had seen this happen all over, you know, the world uh, in terms of uh, governments being against it, people trying to uh, be for it and all of those stuff. Uh, and uh, I, 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 the other thing that was at, uh, at the top of my mind was hyper growth. How do I achieve the next level of growth for my company? And I thought, uh, because Binance has done that, you know, one of those few companies to grow rapidly in under two years, they reached a billion dollars in revenue. Uh, so I said, I could learn this uh, if I closely monitor and see how they are growing internally. So, so the uh, conversation went in that direction of uh, an acquisition and we got acquired in 2019. Um, uh, I think the first exchange to get acquired by a international company. Um, so, so it was good. And, uh, but the idea was not an exit. The idea was uh, more growth. Uh, I had two options, either to raise money or to go for this. And I chose to go for this uh, because uh, more than money, uh, I think by then we were making enough. We were profitable as well. Uh, by the time we were getting acquired, uh, I, I wanted to understand how to grow in this ecosystem. And I think I made the right decision because uh, we've grown 10x after that uh, in the last uh, one year in terms of um, trading volume and uh, user signups have shot up. So it's been a good ride. Um, it's continuing now. We're still working on it. But yeah, I think the last 12 months after acquisition, we got acquired in November 2019. And uh, you know, now we are close. It's it's actually you know almost a year. It's going to be a year soon. So yeah, it's been a crazy ride. Of course, uh, there are multiple reasons why we grew because uh, I think Binance was lucky. Maybe uh, you know we got acquired in November 2019, 
and uh, march 2020 we won the <laughs> supreme court case so uh, you know <laughs> I, i don't know maybe uh, one of their uh, uh, thing is to be lucky i guess because uh, we finally the court case winning the court case opened up the india market and uh, were you guys were that, you guys involved with that court case or once binance came in that kind of uh, play a more of a central role or no no uh, so we were part of the uh, ima i am a uh, um, you know mm. we were part of ima and uh, part of the case that way not directly got it got and, it and uh, uh, binance did not really uh, you know help it was just uh, the case just happened to yeah yeah know, yeah it's quite get done So what else yeah, anything else to show on i mean that's a fascinating story i'm sure i'm sure some bollywood producer has to pick this one up they they'll need a better looking actor but uh <laughs> <laughs> this is a epic epic story bad it's just so inspirational and ah, lays out a framework right lays out a fr- or at least a possible a possible framework for for other countries as well that are butting their head up against the similar types of challenges because i don't know i i sometimes think that what happened the recently in india is the most important thing right it's like the most important thing in the bitcoin ecosystem and i, I know i'm biased but i think it's that way because satoshi created bitcoin to challenge these centers of power and the fact that there are uh, entities doing it legally innovatively you know using solutions and you know using the will of the people uh Ah, it's too much. It's awesome. I love it. Okay, so what's next? What's next? What? What? Is there anything else you want to share on on the Wazir X side? I mean, uh, before we move on, maybe to some of the more like contrarian questions. Um, no, I I mean we can talk all day, but I think we've covered a good uh, uh, part of the important parts on. Um, yeah, like you said, I think um, you know what happens is. at least when i see from my point of view uh, we been uh, startup people building products um, this got me into regulations this also uh, got me in thinking that someone has to be there there has to be a first time and there has to be uh, you know those first wave of people who help in regulation as well uh, and you know it's just that we've never encountered this because for us all of us in our generation things were already put into place and uh, we just always uh, fit into that uh, but here's an opportunity where a new world is being created a new financial system is being created so these uh, these problems that we encounter they're nothing but they're just the stepping stones towards a better regulation a better environment for the future so if you think about it 10 years from now or 20 years from now when entrepreneurs build on top of uh, you know decentralized ecosystems for them everything would be set in place but someone had to fight for it you know the way we probably use some of the older uh, traditional financial systems which are uh, i'm sure there have been a lot of heartaches 30 years or 40 years ago with uh, people building on traditional finance so so i think we should all be up for this we should not look at this as uh, why is this happening but it's happening because uh, something new is being created uh, both fi- uh, financially legally uh technically everything if you think about it we are not uh, drawing on existing models and just pulling that up and glowing that up we are creating something from scratch from the ground up so i think these things are expected mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. of course it's never easy you don't want to be in the center of uh, something broken and you know having to fight for it but that's what the situation is right now very fascinating man okay so let's maybe shift gears a bit uh yeah what so is there one truth that you hold that you think other bitcoiners most bitcoiners would you know disagree with you on uh i think if you talk about maximalist uh, I, I, you know the one thing that i see is that i don't see it as zero and one uh, i i come across most people who say it's just going to be bitcoin and everything else is i know shit coins and stuff but uh i look at it as uh, uh, you know this is again coming to decentralization and uh, the fact that anyone can build anything they want uh, i think there will always be uh, tons of cryptocurrencies in fact we barely scratch the surface it's going there is going to be a millions of cryptocurrencies eventually and each will have its own use case of course i don't see a second bitcoin being the other crypto but there will be different use cases and that will always exist Uh, so i think that's one view i do not hold uh, with uh, you know most of the people who only think about uh, bitcoin as the only crypto um, 
I, I go against what, what other cryptos are, are have caught your imagination or you think are, are you're bullish on or whatever? I don't, I, I'm not, you know, or no, I'm, I'm just wondering like say, Ethereum, for example, uh, or like that's kind of the yeah, number two, I, right? see, I, when, yeah, when I look at Ethereum, for example, that's a, that's a good, uh, um, example where they have a specific use case. It's a world computer. Anyone can run a, a program. Um, and, uh, that was never possible before. I, if I had to run a, uh, you know, a, a script, I had to have my own servers mm -hmm. and, uh, put it, I put it somewhere on Amazon and, uh, you know, do that. Now I just have to code and just put it online. Uh, on on the uh, Ethereum blockchain and it just beautifully works and uh, that's a solid use case mm -hmm. and uh, you know that's that's where and I can use the Ethereum example a lot of times I give it where people you know because uh, people who do not understand the crypto ecosystem what they say is uh, why do you need crypto like in India they say why do you need crypto you have INR which uh, you can transfer instantly and uh, the transactions are uh, almost zero fee. Um, then I have to tell them that to run this piece of code on the Ethereum, there's no company sitting out there accepting your INR. The only way I can run the code is if I pay with Ether. Um, you know, so that's a new use case. It's not these cryptocurrencies are not here to replace existing use cases, but they are here to enhance and uh, build new use cases. And you know, that's how technology has always been. We, uh, for a lot of us, we think that uh, technology is here to kill something that exists and take its place. Mm. But if you look at, if you look at data, technology mm -hmm. has always added, like for example, right from e-commerce, the size of the market has always increased. It's never, uh, you know, eating into something, it's creating more of it. Mm. And that's the same thing I see with cryptocurrency. The more cryptocurrencies and the more specific use cases, they're going to expand the economy. They're going to expand the use cases. So I think, uh, you know, that's why I also encourage as many cryptos to come. Of course, you have in between where there are opportunists who want to just take advantage of the situation. But in general, I think overall, we'll see a larger economy being built if we look at all of these cryptos that are being built, where Ethereum is one of them. Got it. Got it. Interesting. Uh, okay, so what about that same question, but as it maybe pertains to the world? And and, and it's okay to pass if you don't want to you know, answer it. <laughs> um, see, I think I keep having you know new answers every time i learn something then that's my view uh, now i'm in that zone about uh, one of the realization i've had recently is uh, you know it's not always zeros and ones um, um, and i i'm i'm trying to learn more of that um, you know that's uh, that's a so the thing is uh, when you look at machines you always think of zeros and ones and that's okay because machines are either running or they're not uh, they're either doing this or they're not uh, but when it comes to humans, uh, it's never zero and one. There's a third state in between. And that's what makes us human. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we should take that philosophy into a lot of things like, you know, uh, arguing over something. And uh, it does not have to be you being right and the other person being wrong. Uh, both can be right. That's a state where both can be right. Uh, similarly, with I think we had our conversation in the beginning where you said uh, there are others doing this uh, kind of podcast, but you have a different reason. Sometimes the reason can be the same. And, uh, you know, the world has enough uh, capacity to uh, accommodate as many people and their ambitions as needed. Because mm -hmm. I, I, I and, and I'll say this about uh, building companies, for example, a lot of times we get an idea and then we are like, no, there are four companies already doing this. I'm not going to do it. Uh, but I think if you have conviction in that idea and if you think you can uh, build it, well, I think you should jump in and the objective may not always be to kill them to exist or survive. You can just grow on your own. Uh, you know, like we were the, not the first exchange, we were not even the fifth exchange, but we carved our own niche and we grew on our own. And the idea was never to kill someone and, uh, you know, grow, but to grow the pie, grow the ecosystem. And I think that's how you should also think about building companies. I've always, before it was always for me, I need to find an innovative idea. I need to, uh, be the only player in the market because it's always a monopoly is what I always thought, but it never is. You know, there, there's, there's room for everyone to build things, to survive, to thrive. And uh, that's my new worldview now. <laughs> Very fascinating. That That's interesting. Cool. So, okay. Those, those were kind of my, my, uh, American gladiator style questions. You know, I had a, I had a couple of uh, a couple of other ones, but before we get to those, Nishal, is, is there anything that you kind of wish I had asked uh, that maybe I, I didn't? Um, no, I think our 
it's hard to think of questions i've been answering them right <laughs> so i i yeah i know yeah, yeah. i'm just wondering like is there anything top of mind or super exciting that's happening in your world that maybe you wanted to share that maybe we didn't get to um i think we could discuss about uh, the pandemic coming up with new set of use cases i've been looking at them i've been trying to because if you if you see uh, and from a crypto point of view as well uh, the there's a lot of stuff happening in the in this whole lockdown and people uh, sitting at home i have not really seen something emerge for the crypto ecosystem like we are still the same uh, before the pandemic and after the, you know during the pandemic except for prices rising i think i have not seen anything innovative come out which is taking advantage of the fact that people are sitting at home um, so i don't know i think i think someone should build something in that direction where uh, uh it takes advantage of the fact that more people are sitting at home today than ever before um you know i don't know i don't have an idea but i've always been thinking that this ecosystem should also take advantage of that in some way of course our signups have increased more people are signing up to our uh, product now because they're sitting at home but that's that's just the same thing you know uh, like for example mm. live video has become like uh, you know zoom meetings me- meetings online have become like a thing now uh, mm. live video there are products that are focusing on live video now so something like that i think in the ecosystem of cryptocurrencies that has not happened where they say this emerged because of the pandemic or at least i i'm not aware of it so i think uh, something like that should emerge hopefully maybe in the next 3 6 months we'll see something mm mm interesting interesting hey i was going to ask you some uh come other questions so do you think much about ai i mean you're like a ones and zeros kind of guy it sounds like so have you been following things like deep learning have you ever heard of the concept of like the technological singularity and guys like raymond kurzweil i'm just curious have you so uh i was big into ai in uh 2015 uh, mm-hmm, uh mm-hmm. when uh when we were building our previous product we uh we also started building a market here for uh, people the idea was that all these small medium businesses uh, while they have some amazing stuff they sell online or they have services to offer one of the biggest uh, reason why they fail is because they do not know how to market themselves see large companies have marketing teams they know how to reach customers but mm-hmm. an individual creator uh, who's creating stuff like even a podcaster for example they might have an amazing podcast but they don't know how to reach their audience mm. so we embarked on a journey on can we build a marketing brain uh, that would tell you every day what to do and uh, you just had to tap a few buttons and your marketing is done for that day so it's like mm. your personal market here and we started doing that we started building it out uh, uh, eventually it see it was more ambitious uh, we achieved a bit but uh, you know the market did not accept that uh, because what happened is you know if you were to build ai the, the 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 thing is you cannot have a substandard ai and what i mean by that and we were probably too early 2015 even now if you see ai hasn't reached this stage ai has to be smarter or doing more than what we do for it to emerge as a winner and which is why i i believe that uh, it's not become common place yet uh, it will take longer but eventually what will happen is ai will be able to do things that are probably better than what we do and when that happens uh for example uh, you know i see uh, these auto replies on uh, uh, your gmail sometimes you get those suggestions you know uh, and you can use them but it you know that without your uh, uh, without your uh, you choosing the option it will never be right because it's going to be something random as a reply so you have to choose the right reply so it's still dependent on you it's more of a suggestion uh, but the day an ai can actually auto respond to your emails understand the email and auto respond i think that's when it gets interesting and that's when it will be ubiquitous so ha, have you eventually at, there it will be have you looked at open ai and gpt3 a little bit uh no uh, i've been hearing about them but uh, you know ever since i got into uh, crypto then i stopped i'm more of a uh, you know maximalist when it comes to building my uh, startups i then forget everything else Yeah, uh, yeah. Then I'm unaware of it. Uh, I know I'm similar. I'm similar on that sense. Um, uh, the the GPT three thing though, it blew my mind. Uh, there's this. I keep talking about it, but there's this. Uh, there's this big OG Bitcoiner guy named Marzon or something like that. I can't even pronounce his name, but he he wrote a blog. talking about how he used gpt3 it's like a language natural language processor with like all this crazy ai behind it but he used it to essentially come up with um like comments for bitcoin talk 
and it was this whole blog about how he used it and uh, these were the results and these were the things that were good and bad and then at the end of the blog at the end of the blog there's like a line and then he goes I have a confession this entire blog was written by GPT-3 like I didn't even come up with this experiment I haven't even been to Bitcoin talk in years I just fed it these like two lines where I just told it, this is what I do. This is, you know, this is who I am. And it figured out everything else. Um, I also am a big fan of Tesla, you know, like my car dude drives itself. <laughs> it actually right. drives itself. And yeah, uh, is it better than me? Maybe not. Uh, but there are times where like it will grab that middle line in that highway and it'll do it far better than than I do. Like I will swerve a little bit here and there, but it will not. Right. So, but but you know, but all these things we're talking about are like narrow bands of AI, right? They're like application specific. You could argue that Google is an AI. You could argue Bitcoin is this like self-regulating, you know, global supercomputer of an AI, right? I mean, potentially, but. Uh, have you ever thought about like this, this merger of like, where you get like general AI or, you know, what people talk about, like, you know what I mean? Something like, like super cheap that anybody can buy for under a thousand dollars that can do anything and everything. And, you know, and, and they're saying that this might come in our lifetime. Right. Um, and what does that mean for, for like humanity? And, uh, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> do you, I don't know about, uh, I, I, I think, I think I'm, I'm more, uh, tending towards, uh, specialized, uh, you know, AI models working more than general, because if you think about even the, even humans, we ultimately are specialists in some area that we are uh, good at and the rest we are just okay. Mm. So, uh, you know, I think, I think specialized, uh, models will work way better. Because mm. they'll be able to do the job in a efficient way in that uh, sector or segment that they are aware of. But you don't uh, think they'll be speaking... replacing like me as like uh, my wife won't just prefer you know Sunny I O over over me anytime soon, right? I don't have to worry no, about I that. I don't. I don't. I don't think so. I, and I hope not. I hope not. Uh, no, for our sake. <laughs> I don't know, dude. She does spend more time with her phone than she does with me, and it's hard to kind of get her attention. So I wouldn't be too surprised. They have to make it better right. looking than an iPhone. <laughs> But, you know, uh, but one of the things that uh, I always uh, look at, uh, you know, uh, the, the fact that uh, computers, for example, uh, before Bitcoin, they, they knew how to transfer information between each other. Uh, but Bitcoin has made it uh, possible for them to transfer value between each other, you know, a peer to peer value transfer. And uh, you combine AI. And then you will have systems which can actually interact with each other and transfer value and have an ecosystem of uh, uh, machines that can exist on their own without needing us because machines can create value uh, and they can transact with each other and they can transfer information. So that's like a living organism if you think about it. I, I do. I, I can think about it a lot. In fact, I'm going to interview later today this guy named Bennett uh, Bennett Hoffman, who is the CTO of a company called Buttercoin that was backed by Google Ventures and Y Combinator. And they had hired me as their, it was like a Bitcoin company back in 2012, I think, 2013. And it was, I think Bennett was the first one who told me about this notion that when my, you know, future driving, whatever, self-driving car passes, let's say yours, uh, you know, both of our cars will know, you know, that you don't have anything on your calendar. You're just on a drive home. I'm late for my meeting um, and I'm willing to pay X Satoshis for you to let me pass you. And they just automatically have this like transfer of wealth. You move out of the way, I zip past you and boom, you know. Uh, I actually think one of my, one of my contrarian beliefs, I believe that Bitcoin will be used more by machines in the next 10 years yeah. than it will be by humans. Right. Absolutely. And this is what I'm talking about, adding to existing economies and existing systems, rather than, you know, trying to replace what exists and what works. Um, these are new use cases that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Yeah. Okay. Uh, one more thing. So this is such an interesting conversation. Um, do you think much about Ubi? Like uh, um, universal basic income, which is like this okay. idea that, and it kind of feeds into this, this, like, okay, if we just look at like self-driving cars as an example, right? Like you believe that cars drive themselves, right? Yeah. Yeah. So how many people drive for a living? You talked about Uber recently, right? Like what, how many people drive for a living? So overnight almost, 
all those people become replaced by one, not even like general AI, but one, you know, specialized AI by one company, um, you know, I could see a world where doctors are, are jeopardized, right? If you look at like natural language processing, the amount of information they have to process and kind of compute and be right on, like we should be using, you know, potentially like machines for some of that. Like I could see how a nurse is less likely to be replaced than maybe a doctor in terms of like when you think about AI. So I guess my, 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 where I'm going with this is that there is this, this kind of thought that, you know, technology, and I know I sound like a Luddite, I sound like a socialist and I'm neither one of those, right? Um, but I also think it's important to be impo important to be responsible about technology and, and, and think about like the perils and the threats. Cause I think sometimes us like engineers, we get too fascinated by like how exciting, you know, a new toy is. And we forget that we live in a world where, you know, other humans live as well. Right. Um, right. But, 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 but universal basic income, and, you know, this is already showing up in lots of parts of the world. Like I know in Canada, for example, if you lost your job, you got money, like <laughs> didn't almost matter who you were or whatever. And I'm hearing the governments are moving towards it. I'm not excited by that fact, because to me, that means that it's essentially like systematic money printing and taking it away from the people who are earning it and giving it to those who didn't earn it. So I don't like that notion, but, but I also kind of get stuck in terms of like, what's going to happen maybe? Like, are we going to tell everybody to become a programmer? Look at GPT-3. It can program for you. You literally say what you want it to do and it designs the program for you. Um, anyway, so, so I don't know, I don't know. Have you thought about it? Is it even a thing in India now? Like, uh, like universal basic income, are they talking about no, it? Like, I how think, are people getting uh, by in the pandemic? Right. No, I think, I think, uh, UBI in India is a part of, uh, I think it's more of the developed nations who probably have the luxury to think about that right now. Uh, you know, but the reason for, uh, universal basic income, like what you said about, uh, uh, drivers losing their jobs to uh, AI. Uh, what I've seen and what I believe is that uh, every time, let's say, uh, technology takes away 10,000 jobs, uh, it probably creates 100,000 jobs. And uh, uh, look at, look at, for example, look at uh, what social networks did, like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. It created um, millions of jobs as influencers, you know, as uh, people who can uh, monetize their hobby. That was not uh, possible maybe 10, 10 years, 15 years ago, where uh, you can monetize your hobby and make a living from that. Uh, make a living doing what you love doing, which otherwise in that old world, most of these people would have to go to a, uh, a sad uh, nine to five job, which they hate uh, to make a living, where now they just uh, have fun doing what they do and uh, you know earn money. So I think uh, uh, most of these, if the drivers go out of work, I'm sure they will probably end up doing something they love uh, rather than, you know, uh, worry about uh, not being uh, without a job. I believe that uh, there will be ways for them to monetize their passion. And I think the passion economy, I, uh, that's something that uh, I've been very monitoring closely for a long time. I think that's going to blow up even more. We're just scratching the surface of the passion economy. Oh, and oh, That's a, my first time hearing that, the passion economy. What the hell is that? That sounds cool. <laughs> uh, uh, so it's, you know, let's say a podcaster, YouTubers, all of these influencers, uh, they're part of the passion economy where they're doing what they're passionate about and uh, they're earning money for that. Uh, it's not a job. Uh, if you think about it, that's entrepreneurship. Uh, even if, uh, you know, you're doing it alone, you're, you have a podcast which pays for your uh, rent and your living that's great and i think that's going to blow up even more as ai comes into uh, you know automating uh, regular uh, um, jobs uh, which are non creative the creative world will uh, blow up even more and uh, you know the thing the, the thing is uh, and why is it growing is because we've been used to the factory model of content creation and everything and that was needed in the uh, first phase of our uh, online world where a few companies decided what we should learn, what we should read, what we should consume. Uh, but we are individuals mm. and I might love, love watching something which you don't. And that's perfectly fine because mm. we will all have more choices. Uh, more choices because there are more people getting into the passion economy, creating content for their kind of audience. And uh, that's where I see more jobs opening up, you know, as this AI creeps in. Uh, the passion economy grows fa faster. 
so I'm not a big UBI fan. I think uh, uh, UBW would be better, like a universal basic work for everyone. Uh, you know, get some work, uh, you know, give them a channel uh, to uh, put their uh, passion in front of people and make money. I think that's going to be even more interesting to look forward to. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Well, that sounds like an exciting future. Uh, what, uh, where, so where do people learn more about you, about, you know, your company, your, I don't know, all that, like what's kind of the domain um, and all that? I'm on Twitter. Nishil Shetty is my uh, um, handle. I'm also on LinkedIn. You can add me on LinkedIn as well, but I'm very active on Twitter. Um, you know, feel free to DM me and at, at reply. I'll be happy to connect. Awesome, man. Uh, I guess that was pretty much uh, all the main questions I wanted to ask you today. You got anything for me or should we maybe bring this to a close and do a follow up some other time? Uh, I think one question, what uh, what made you, um, you know, uh, get into Bitcoin? Because I think uh, you were you've been into this very, very early. Uh, so what what was the mm -hmm. reason you got into this? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I, uh, my main reason was that I've always been asking myself the question, what is money? And I feel like it is the one thing that, and I've traveled a lot, like, you know, my parents are from India. I grew up in Canada. My wife's from Colombia. Like I've probably been to over 120 countries. I don't know. Um, and the one common thread that I found among every human I've met, like whether it's, you know, six-year-old daughter of mine or, you know, a 95-year-old grandmother, it's not religion. It's not Donald Trump or Modi. It's, it's, it's money. It's like literally money. That's the one thing that you just, you just like in the middle of a party, you could be like money and people will just like stop and look over. And <laughs> it's like, it has like this, I don't know, this like instinctive kind of reaction. And I've always... Um, so after I, I finished engineering, I started my own financial brokerage almost 20 years ago in, in pursuit of trying to understand that question. Um, and ironically, at the end of like three, four years, I felt like I understood less about money than I did at the beginning. And so I, I just never could get that question answered. And then finally, um, I think it was like Ron Paul. Do you know who Ron Paul is? Dr. Ron yeah. Paul. He was like running for president, I think many years ago. And so I had started hearing him. He started talking about gold and how gold used to be money and how gold is money. And then I was living in India at the time and kind of saw um, how people my age and people older than me like really truly valued gold, unlike you know people in North America. And that really got me more interested. Um, and then finally, one day in 20, I think 11 is what my wife says. I think I have a tweet back in 2011 saying that I, I was just tweeting about like the big, you know, what is Bitcoin YouTube video became kind of like madly obsessed because I, I felt like I had this, you know, this like unfair kind of advantage where I felt like I, I saw the future of money. And, um, and the thing about Bitcoin that really fascinates me is that it's like, it, to me, it was like a zero to one, you know, like unit step function in like in math, it was like that to me and everything before it and everything after it. Okay. And I'm very passionate about that too, is everything after it as well that I've seen does not Changing three parameters in the Litecoin code does not equate to innovation. Making something Turing complete even when Bitcoin is possible to make Turing complete doesn't, to me, mean zero to one. It's, it's cute. It's cute. But we yeah. saw what happened with Infura. We saw what's happening with the Dow fork. We've seen what's happened with it. And, I, and, I, and I've seen and known about Ethereum because I'm from Toronto, you know, two years before they even came out with it. In fact, I'm interviewing the co-founder of Ethereum on Saturday. So I, I'm, I'm bullish. I love, I love the innovation. I'm first and foremost like a free market, you know, guy. But, but I think to have a good, solid free market, you need to solve money. And you need to solely, like a laser beam, focus on solving money, not about solving every application and making them decentral. That is cute. That is secondary. But one half of every transaction in the free market is money. And if you don't get that right, like I don't see anyone doing other than Bitcoiners, um, then I don't think you have anything else. You don't have a free market. You don't have innovation. You have it. So, so to me, I'm, I'm, I see myself as a bit of a... A Bitcoin maximalist, you know, and, and, um, and yeah, and then part of, you know, and, and, you know, I was talking, talking to Subtik the other day too about this is that, you know, it's not about how much money we make. Okay. 
it, it, it is somewhat about how much money we make others, right? Because that's adding value to people's lives. But if it means that we need to make money at the cost of others, that worries me. You know what I mean? Like, so let's say 10 yeah. years from now, if I screw over a hundred thousand people, but I have $10 million in the bank, but if the next 10 years, I only screw over like say one person by accident, but I, you know what I mean? I generate only a million dollars. To me, the million dollar outcome is a bit more of a better outcome than the 10 million, because it's not about maximizing my profit. It's about also doing what's right for humanity. So I saw a lot of what was happening after Bitcoin as scary. And we tried to stay away from it because we saw the ICO boom and the, you know, and I used to be a financial advisor. So I've gotten all my licenses in this space as well. And so I knew that taking money for your neighbor from a speculative venture, whether I agree with it or not, I knew that it was like one of the most kind of illegal things you could do in the United States for sure in Canada and globally. Because you because I don't I don't even want if my neighbor has a hundred grand in the bank, I don't want 50 grand of his. I don't. I want to go to Tim Draper, who has billions in the bank. If he lose, if I God forbid lose, you know, whatever he gave us, he's not gonna lose sleep. And to me, that's a much more moral kind of way of building our business, not listing every shit coin in the name of free market and hoping I'll make money. But like, to me, these things really bug me. But I, I just think Bitcoin is like it, man. I think Bitcoin, I just want to encourage more people to look at Bitcoin. If I could make Uno coin a Bitcoin only shop, I would. Um, and yeah, man, I don't know. I'm just like a hardcore Bitcoiner. <laughs> I love everything about it. I think it fixes the financial system. I think it's, it's and the fact that it's inflation proof um, is, I would say, the number one thing that if I die 20 years from now, and Bitcoin succeeds, and and it, I had even like a point zero 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 one percent in in helping that, I will die happy because I knew that I I re, I was helping to remove probably the one of the most evil things I've ever learned about, which is money printing and just the fact that people can, you know, do what they do and do it kind of in guise of you know monetary policy, but it's literally I don't see it how it's different from from stealing. So yeah, so I'm very like morally, I guess, gravitated towards Bitcoin. I love Bitcoin, man. I just want to help it uh, succeed. And I got to admit, man, uh, just in closing, I have a tremendous amount of respect for you and what you've done for Bitcoin. Um, and it gives me a lot of hope in humanity. And I, I think, you know, it was a very dark, dark time. And, you know, while Unocoin took the path of fighting it kind of in the legal courts, like it was a Harish, I'm sure you know, that was in the yeah. every day, 4 a.m., literally fighting the battle. Um, and, you know, and we, we at that point didn't feel like we had that we had the risk tolerance to, you know, do things like ICOs and, you know, and whatnot and, and do like a peer to peer thing, which we thought was in violation of the RBI's notice. Um, mm -hmm. For us, you know, we had regulators coming to our door from 2013, right? We had 50, 30 people yeah. in the tax department on day one. So for us, we have, you know, a different worldview, if you will, right? Because we came in at a time and we've had our, our asses whooped, right? <laughs> time and time again. And right. so, so, but, but like I said, you know, Bitcoin doesn't depend on me or Satvik or our or Unocoin. It depends on Bitcoin. <laughs> And so the yeah. fact that it brought people like you in, and I'm not lying, you know, the model you guys took was the model that I, I was trying to convince our team a year before the notice even came into place because we saw it coming. Mm -hmm. And we were like, guys, this is obviously going to work. But our lawyers, you know, wouldn't have it. But it was our lawyers who beat, uh, you know, who, I mean, it was, it was you know, Sinisha Desai has been our, our right. shareholder and lawyer since 2014, 2014. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, but they were the ones, I believe that that victory in court was monumental. I think what happened there, um, you know, I think, I think everyone deserves credit, but I think the lawyers who fought the battle, they don't get enough of it. And part of my reason for doing these, you know, Bitcoin stories is I want to shine a light on people like you, people like Nishit, people like Harish, people who are making it happen, you know, and I think the pandemic actually overshadowed a lot of the good work uh, you guys did. And so, so yeah, that, that's the one of my main goals, man, is just to help. So I, I just appreciate so much everything you do. The fact that you came on this show, listen to, you know, me ask my weird questions. I don't know. I'm down to do this again. If you want to do it, like I said, next week, next month, whenever. <laughs> yeah, sure. No, thanks. I think uh, it, it was a great conversation and, uh, uh, you know, it's always good to uh, I, I, every time I ask people why are you into you know Bitcoin or crypto, uh, there's always a new uh, different answer that you get. 
uh, and that's the interesting thing about it. It's not like a single-minded approach that everyone has the same uh, kind of view. Everyone has different worldviews, and they still converge on this single idea of Bitcoin. Uh, that's I think that's the interesting part. And um, yeah, I think everyone should uh, go towards that uh, idea and uh, you know try to achieve it. Like you solving money, me solving for the tech. I think. Um, Somewhere it will all converge uh, into something beautiful, uh, but uh, now yeah we are all on that path. Let's uh yeah man move love forward. it love it. So yeah, let's all work together. I mean, look, I mean, uh, I think I publicly said that I I you know have a man crush on on uh, ZebPay's co-founders. You know, even though they're not uh, running ZebPay anymore, but guys like Mahin and them, I actually bought my first Bitcoin because of those guys. So. Uh -huh. Uh, so I have nothing but respect for, for, you know, people that we compete with, if you will. Um, I, I think it's just a matter of, at the end of the day, we're all fighting, I think, for Bitcoin to a large extent, right? Like if, Bitcoin's, if Bitcoin fails, I think we all agree that, you know, all the other coins probably might not have the same type of future, right? Like, I mean, Bitcoin is kind of the most secure, the most decentralized, the most robust, the biggest market cap. You know, you have public companies, private companies. I mean, it's just... I think it's hitting a new kind of level of, um, you know, I think like some global awareness that that I don't, I think it's just in, in the timing and like everything that's happening. It's like, ah, oh, it's exciting, man. It's exciting. <laughs> Anyways, listen, I've been, I've kind of, I think I've uh, taken up the full full 90 minutes here. I don't want to take up more of your time, Michelle. Like I said, if you want to do this again, we we'll, can do it again soon, but thank you. Uh, thank you for this. Sure. I'm going to kill yeah. it. All right. Yeah.